I want to put all of you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. For our um, service this morning, let's take our Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. We're going to read from Exodus chapter 14. Um, and by God's grace, I will keep to time because I, I know very well that what you really want is music. <laughs> Nami, I want it. <laughs> Me, myself, I don't want the sermon. But I was asked to preach it. So I also want to get out of my own way so I can listen to music. Um, Exodus chapter 14 is where we are. Exodus 14, that's the second book of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 14. Bring your Bible to church. Always bring your Bible to church, whether it's in a phone or tablet or physically. Bring Bible to church. Church is not a movie cinema. We are not here to entertain you. Bring the Bible. We are not actors and we are just watching in a cinema. Bring your Bible. Can't go to church and not have a Bible. It doesn't work. Whether it's in a phone or tablet, I don't care where it is. It's not the pages that are holy, it's the content. Okay? But bring a Bible to church. Please, young people, bring a Bible to church. You, you can't delete the Bible app to make space for nonsense. There's an app that must never leave your, your phone. It's your Bible. Okay? Delete everything else. Delete photos. But keep the Bible. You understand? If you don't know where to store your photos, open a, a cloud account, store them there. But have the Bible. Because this thing that we are, we are reading from the Bible and we are looking at us. You know, like I'm Stephen Segal, I'm not. It's, it's church, it's not entertainment. And, and, and also, this is why it matters. For over a thousand years in Christianity, the Roman Catholic Church refused for people to read the Bible. Only their priests could read it. But people died for you to read it for yourself. Now we have it, you are not reading it. It doesn't work. This is why pastors are making you drink petrol and all sorts of things. Because you're not reading your own Bible. You are hearing the man of God tell you, read, read your own Bible. Okay? So, so I'm that guy. It's very important to me that when I preach, you don't treat me like a movie. You follow from your own. Exodus 14. Um, we are going to start reading from verse 1. Follow me in your different versions and translations. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the children of Israel to turn back and camp near Phi Harihoth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hanged by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will again glorify, uh, for my, glorify myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did as the Lord commanded. And when Pharaoh, king of Egypt, was informed that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh commanded his officials, changed his mind, and charged them, saying, What have we done? We have released the Israelites to go, and now we have lost our laborers. So he had his chariot, together with the chariots of his army, charged for war. He took 600 of his best chariots, along with other chariots of the Egyptians, with officers riding on them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, with all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen, the army and all the troops, they pursued all the Israelites and overtook them where they camped by the sea in Pi 
high heroes opposite Baal the form. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked, and there the Egyptians were marching towards them. They were terrified, and in fear cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have brought us here in the desert to die, we and our children? What have we done? What have we done to you that you would bring us out of Egypt to such a disaster? Did we not say to you while in Egypt, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Surely it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, saying, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you on this day. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to keep your peace. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to march forward. Raise your staff. Stretch it out with your hand over the sea to divide the waters so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry land. I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will pursue you. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory to Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Shall we pray together? Baba, we to who says, read it on his second, go see it to Uchesu Presco. He is the Lankole, Lingwele, Linamanja. To interpret it unless we are given access by you. We need you through the Holy Spirit to now give us access into your word. Its meaning, its power, its teachings in our lives. Give us access into it so that having read it and understood it and preached it and listened to it, your word may now transform us and accomplish its purpose in our lives. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. The, the, the book of Exodus forms one of the five books that are written by Moses, commonly known as the Pentateuch. The Jews would call them the law. When the Jews speak about the law, this is something that Christians need to be careful of and correct. When the Jews speak about the law, they are not talking about the Ten Commandments. They are talking about the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In Judaism, they all are the law. It's not just the Ten Commandments, but it's the whole package of Moses' writing. They call it the law, the Torah, the law of God. The second of these books of the law is, of course, Exodus. Genesis tells the history of the beginning. Secondly, it's Exodus. It tells the story of God delivering the Israelites and establishing a nation through which he would ultimately have the Messiah to be born. The book of Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, traditionally we all believe they were written by Moses, but of course anyone who pays attention to the books quite carefully will realize that although Moses might have been the original author, but the final work we have is a result of generations of scribes polishing and making sure that the story are put through properly. I'll give you a simple example. Although it is Moses who writes the book of Deuteronomy, how does he record his own death? Do you understand? It is because although he writes the book, but he's not the only author, someone else finishes off the work. 
Because if Moses is dead, how is he writing about himself dying? He's dead. So the fact that we have the story of his death means that scribes and other writers, especially the priests, Phineas, Eliaza, and others, they stepped in to finish the work or the story of Moses and the exodus of the Israelites. But I want us to focus specifically today on Exodus chapter 14. The story begins by telling us that the Israelites are now slaves to the Egyptians. And, and, and I think if, 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 if you've ever paid attention in church, you will know why they are slaves to the Egyptians. It all began when Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt. And after 20 years, he became the governor of Egypt. And from there onwards, he brings his brothers and their families into Egypt. And that is how they got there. And the Bible says, unfortunately, they came a pharaoh that didn't know Joseph. And so the Israelites immediately became slaves to the Egyptians. And this happens for about 420, 430 years. At the end of this period, God calls a man called Moses from birth. When Moses is born, God preserves his life and manages to keep him in the house of Pharaoh for 40 years. And this is interesting because Moses will one day deliver Israel from Pharaoh, but grows up in Pharaoh's house for 40 years first. But one day he will deliver the Israelites from the power of the Pharaohs, but spends his 40 years being taken care of by the pharaohs. The same people he will need deliverance from one day are the same people who are taking care of him. By the way, it doesn't begin there. These are the same people who were killing the two-year-old boys, but are raising him. They killed all the children under the age of two who are Hebrews. But when the princess found him, she raised him. So they are busy killing other children who are Hebrews, but are raising this one. And, and, and that's important because what it is teaching all of us is, is the fact that don't be quick to run away from your enemies. Some of your enemies are important to God. They will raise you. Some of the hardship you are going through, don't escape it. God is raising you in it. He is using it to take you somewhere. The problem is we like escaping. But we don't understand God does not escape. God uses every moment to glorify himself. So there are things that God allows you and I to go through. Not because he has no power to deliver. But because while it thinks it will destroy you, he thinks it will raise you. Yeah. So sometimes you may fast, asking for God to get you out. And God says, stay. And you say, no, but God, get me out. And God says, no, 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 no. You are not going anywhere. Stay. You are not staying because God is powerless to deliver. You are staying because God has realized Keeping you there has greater benefits in the end than taking you out. Mm. Beloved, nobody has ever become great by having an easy life. I just want us all to get that idea out of our heads. Let me know why me, why am I suffering? Those are questions for average thinkers. God has never produced greatness in comfort. Make peace with it. Why me? Why was I born in poverty? No. Rather, the question should come this way. Lord, because you permitted for me to be born here, where are you taking me? Why is it necessary for you that I must be here now? What do you want to do with me that requires me to be here today? What am I supposed to learn here? And where will it be used tomorrow? 
God is not keeping us where we are because he can't help. We are here because where he is taking us, we need training to get there. Please understand. I'm going to say something controversial. Zimbabwe will not be delivered by the Zimbabweans who left. They are Zimbabweans of comfort. God can't lose them. They left. In other words, comfort was very important to them. The only Zimbabweans God can use to change this country are sitting here. The ones who have been through it all, only they possess the training needed to know what to change. God has never produced greatness in combat. Never. That is why you will never meet a billionaire who stayed in their nine to five job. All billionaires had to resign from work, lose their homes, lose their cars. Some even got divorced by wives of comfort who could not live with a man who keeps trying ideas that fail. But those guys are billionaires today because God has never produced greatness in comfort. The story of Gideon teaches you that. God says to Gideon, take them to the river to drink water. It's very simple. The ones who use cups, they like comfort. Send them home. The ones who jump into the water and drink with their hands, they are ready to embrace hardship. With them, I can make changes. If you are going to be great, and please also understand me very well, let's not force you to be great when you just want to be average. I'm not saying everyone here will be great. Honestly, some of you are okay with an average life. And you are not a sinner by doing that. You are being fair to yourself. So if you know, I just want my salary, my house, I want to look good, God bless you. May he take you to where you want to go. But for those of us who hunger for something greater, those of us who know I can't go to the grave and all that is in my story is I lived and died. For those, embrace difficulty. You must be raised in the courts of Pharaoh for you to face Pharaoh one day. There's no way about it. If one day you will solve poverty for Zimbabwe, let God raise you in poverty. So that one day when you fight poverty, you know your enemy. That's why there's no rich person who will deliver Zimbabwe. They don't know what you are going through. There's no billionaire who's coming for Zim, or South Africa, or Zambia. I can say this because it's about my country. We elected a rich man to become president thinking he'll deliver us. We are in trouble. Because he has no clue what we are going through. Even before he was president, he didn't know the price of fuel. I went to a BMW dealership in Central. I love BMW, that's my favorite brand. And I went there because we were thinking of, 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 of purchasing a 320D. So I'm there and I'm looking at these cars and there was a BMW 7 Series 6.3 liter V12 engine. <laughs> yeah. It's right there spinning. You know when it's spinning, you know. When they put it on that turning table, you know. And I'm looking at this thing, and, and, and I say to the guy who was helping me, man, I wonder what, what, what it chose in terms of fuel. He says to me, Pastor, <laughs> if you are asking that question, <laughs> it's 
Dodgeball Cup. <laughs> the people who buy this car have not known the price of bread for years. So please understand, no one who is comfortable is concerned about your discomfort. It is us who are uncomfortable who need to work with God to turn our uncomfortability into comfort. So allow God to raise you in Pharaoh's house. The Pharaoh's house you are in right now, believe you me, if you stop crying about it and start learning from it, you will realize you are being prepared for addressing it one day. So Moses grows up in the house of Pharaoh for 40 years. Then problems begin in year 40 when he kills an Egyptian. Okay? And he has to run away. I won't focus on that because that's not part of the message for today. He lives. God finds him in the wilderness, living in Midian, married with children. So he is now a shepherd. He is married to Zipporah. They've got children. And God gets him at the burning bush 40 years later. Okay? 40 years after he ran away from Egypt. That matters for today's message. Please understand. The fact that God allows periods of silence in his vision for you does not mean he's forgotten their land. God was silent for 40 years. 40 full years, God is not speaking to Moses about anything. The last time Moses felt that God was speaking to him is when he saw the injustice of an Egyptian beating an Israelite and he intervened by killing the Egyptian. That was him, his sense of justice telling him something is wrong. But after that day, God doesn't come back to say anything to Moses. For 40 years, God is silent. The fact that God has been silent for 5 years, for 10 years in your life is not proof God has abandoned you. God will return when the time is right. That's why the Bible says, when the time is right, I, the Lord, will make it. He will make it happen. I know some of us begin to give up. I've been doing this business for five years. I, 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 I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not winning clients. I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm not growing in my career. Now you're beginning to think of other things, eh? To do. Witchcraft. <laughs> because you are under pressure. The people you started with are now buying a second property, a third property. You have nothing. They are buying a third or fourth car, you've got nothing. And then you begin to say to yourself, wait a minute, maybe I need to try a different God. God has not forgotten you. When your time is right, you will have your burning bush experience. When your time is right. God returns after 40 years and he meets Moses at the burning bush and calls him. Now, Moses has done his work. Now the children of Israel are leaving. And God then says, and these are the lessons I want to touch on and then I'm done. Number one, God says to Moses, lead the children of Israel to this place where the sea will be in front of them. The desert will be in the north. The mountains of Sudan will be in the south. But God doesn't tell them that. He just says, take the children of Israel there. When they get there, it's the worst position you could ever be in. They are cornered. The sea is in front. The mountains are in the south. The desert is in the north. Why would God put them there? Please understand, Moses didn't leave them there. Listen to the story carefully. God chose where they were. So there is something I need all of us to heal from. 
You are not where you are because the devil blended it. God chooses locations. The devil may want to exploit the location, but God chooses locations. This horrible position they are in was not chosen by the devil, beloved. Their God chose it. He is the one who said to Moses, put them there. And if I was God's geography advisor, I would have said, your majesty, this is a bad decision. This is a bad decision. You are leading your people to a place where they will get slaughtered. If I was God's advisor, I would have said, please, rethink this idea. There are other ways we can get them to Canaan land. But if we put them there, they will die. But as if God can hear you and I, he answers and says, so that I, the Lord, will be glorified. Your position right now has nothing to do with you. It is for the glory of God. And if you don't like that tough luck, only God is God. The fact that you and I don't like that position will not change anything. God is God. And he's chosen the location. Standing here, my parents died when I was a year old. Both of them killed, same month. I was a year old, dead, God. I don't like the position I was born in. But that position has made me to know God. In ways I could never explain to anyone. Would I have chosen the position? No. But I'm grateful to him he chose that position. Because what he did with that position is something that even if I try to explain to you who've got parents, you won't get it. You will never know God the way I do. Not you will never know him better. Do you hear that there's a difference? Didn't say I know him better. I don't know him better. But I've got a unique journey that allows me to trust in him in places you will not. Because there, your parents were there for you. I had no one I had to ask him. So if you and I get there, you will cry, I will cross. Because for you, it will be the first time. For me, we've been here before. God chooses positions. And not because he doesn't love us. But because in every position, he must glorify himself. And I need you to understand, I'm not saying the pain you may be going through because of your position makes God laugh. God has permitted this position to be your position because he knows painful as your position is right now, if you give him a chance, greatness will be born out of it. Today it may look like the worst position to occupy. But give God five years in that position, people will not believe you were once there. Ah, are you listening to me? One, one of my favorite billionaires is the Chinese billionaire Jack Ma, the owner of Alibaba. Filthy rich guy, I think he's worth over 50 billion US dollars now. He says in one of his interviews. There was a time when he and his wife lived in an apartment where the bedroom, the kitchen, the bathroom could all see each other. There was no such a thing called privacy. The one in the bed could see the one cooking. And the one cooking could see the one urinating. <laughs> Beloved, if you cannot trust God with the position he's chosen, you are not going to discover what God can do in your life. No one is saying your position is easy. We are all holding different positions here. Some of you are in the position of unemployment, as I speak. Some of you are in the position of divorce, as I speak. Some are in the position of losing money, as I speak. 
Some of you are in a position of losing your car as I speak. Some are in a position of losing your home as I speak. Some of you are in a position of burying your last parent as I speak. It's not a nice position. We are not saying make peace with the position because it's nice. We are saying make peace with it because what God can do in it is far more than we could think or imagine. So now I want you to heal your heart. I want you to heal your heart. Your positions did not come by surprise to God. He has chosen them. Number two. Then he says, when they are there, Pharaoh will pursue them. Pharaoh will pursue them. It's not Pharaoh telling them. It's God telling Moses, Pharaoh will pursue them. So here's the second thing you and I need to know in the journey of life. The devil is coming for you. But God knows. The reason God tells you, he has told you even before the devil makes the decision. See, right now the devil is still deciding whether you are worth chasing. But God has already told you, he's coming for you. What should that do to you? It should mean when he starts pursuing, don't cry as if you are surprised. Rely on the God who told you in advance. God has already told them, the Egyptians will pursue you. Beloved, life problems are coming for you. I don't need to be a prophet. You know this whole thing that happens on television today with, pa with pastors saying, do you want me to prophesy you? Prophesy Papa. Do you want me to prophesy you? Prophesy Papa. Do you want me to prophesy you? Prophesy Papa. There's no prophecy needed here. It's life. Life is coming for you. Yeah. Yeah. This doesn't need a prophecy. It's what life is on earth. Hear me. You, I don't need to be a prophet to tell you death is coming. Yeah. That's not a prophecy. That's life. Either next week or next month or next year or you will be bearing someone you love or they will be bearing you. Don't live in the illusion when God shows you reality. God says to them, the Egyptians are coming. Please, don't be delusional. Don't be delusional. Life is hard and it is going to come for you. You will lose your job. You will lose friends. People will betray you. Eh? How could my best friend sleep with my husband? What do you mean? They are doing it all over the world. It's all about you. It's the pain of life. And it's coming for you. Now, knowing it doesn't mean smile. But it means because God has told you, when it happens, trust the one who knew in advance. Yeah. Ah, are you with me? Yeah. When you get that call that says you need to come home because your mother is no more, God is not saying laugh, but He is saying, Now turn to me who knew it was going to happen. Turn to me and ask me, What plan did I prepare for you when I saw this coming? Turn to me and ask me, What am I going to do about what you are going through? Tell to me, because you didn't know, I knew. So you can't now want to solve it. Ask me, I knew it was coming to you before you were born. So ask me what to do about it. Yeah. Because the problem with humanity is we want to ask ourselves. You want to ask your best friend. <coughs> yeah? How do you deal with, what do you mean? How did your best friend knew, know it was coming? Ask him who knew in advance that this is the journey you will go through. Lastly, God then says to Moses, while they were camping there, they saw it, the Egyptians were coming. When they saw the Egyptians coming, they all cried out. Now they are crying to Moses, and Moses cries to God, because Moses is the leader. So they are crying to Moses, so how could you bring us here? We are going to die here, all sorts of things. And then Moses goes to God and says, look, they are crying. I am crying. We are all crying. Because none of us know what we mean. We are going to do about this. And God says, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to march. 
forward. That statement makes sense if you compare it with the first one, where they speak. They say, how would you bring us here? We are going to die in the wilderness, us and our children, where there are no graves in, in Egypt. We told you, leave us alone. We are willing to serve the Egyptians. Now, this then explains what is happening. Beloved, please hear me very carefully. There is nothing God will do for you as long as you still think like a slave. The mentality of a slave will make you think like a slave even when freedom is in front of you. And this is what God is showing them. He is showing them, I have delivered you from Egypt, but Egypt is in you. Even when you are no longer in Egypt, you think as the Egyptians taught you to think. You've got to understand, beloved Bulawayo, the problem of Africa is not that God hasn't given freedom, it's that the African is slave in the mind. Africa's problem is no longer colonization, it's that Africans are imprisoned here. Africans are imprisoned in church. That is why Jesus saves the African, but the African would rather have salvation through a suit and a tie. Because no matter what the blood of Jesus has done, Africa cannot go to heaven without Europe's permission. Was the time crucified? When you look at the cross, do you see a suit hanging? Saying for them I'm dying. There is nothing God can do for Africa now. He has answered all prayers. The problem now rests in the minds of Africans. And for that, God can do nothing until the African thinks differently. How is it that we are the continent with all the minerals? But after electing Mnangagwa and Sir Ramaphosa, they take a flight to, to England, to Boloman. They are leaving diamonds behind, gold behind. They take a flight to go to London and ask for a loan. The loan they are asking for, the European will take a flight to Africa, take the gold, sell it, Long the African money they were asking for. So, you want to ask for a loan that is backed up by your property. This person sold your property in order to give you a loan. Problem is here. Africa. You know, hear me very well in context one. Africans need to stop praying. It's not that our prayers have not been heard. God has heard all of them. The problem is that the power in the prayers is not being used. Africa is the one continent that prays more than all of them but is achieving nothing. Even in Europe, who are the Christians? Africans. You have filled churches all over the world praying. While you are praying, other nations are using graves. China will take over Zimbabwe when you are praying. I'm not impressed when someone says Zimbabwe has the highest number of Adventists in Africa. Then I say, who have done what? So this big number you are glorifying, how has it helped Zimbabwe to be better economically? You should be embarrassed to be in a big number but suffering with everyone. It means your religion is useless to the problems of the country. It means your Sabbath keeping is useless to Zimbabwe's problem. We, we've 
you've got the biggest number in Africa, but you're poor, but you've got the biggest. How does it work? The problem is here. God is no longer needing the many weeks of prayers in Africa. All he needs now is for the Africans to get up from their knees and use the power they've been praying for. We've been praying God has heard us. God is not deaf. Now get up and do something with the things you've been praying for. What God shows us in Exodus 14 is that even if you give a slave freedom, the slave will still cry for Egypt. Were there no graves in Egypt? Why? Because a slave would rather be buried in comfort than succeed in difficulty. What matters to them is dying comfortably than succeeding in hardship. That's the problem with the slave mentality. You can then go to your churches and complain oh, as if they are preaching politics in the pulpit, but here's what is clear. We refuse to preach a religion that doesn't solve our people's problems. Amen. We are tired of Christianity that promises us a second coming while other nationalities are enjoying life here. Why should God make Africa wait for the second coming? Why didn't he tell the Europeans to do the same thing? If the second coming solves all problems, why didn't God say to the Europeans, you also don't succeed, I'll solve you when I come again? Why hasn't God told China the same thing? Because the Chinese are, are growing powerful every day. If the second coming will solve everything, why hasn't God gone to China and said, no, 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 hold your horses, I'll solve you when I come again? Why does this message only matter for Africa? Jesus is coming. Yes, Jesus is coming and we believe it. But nothing in the second coming says, suffer while I wait, while you wait. You can wait and prosper. You can wait and be happy. But it's about changing this. Beloved, if you are still more concerned about being buried in Egypt, than crossing the desert and thriving in Canaan land. My suggestion is stop praying. You are wasting God's time. Because read your Bible carefully. Prayers are not supposed to be a speech to God. They are a transaction. In a prayer you give faith, he gives power. When you get up, you take that power and use it. But if your prayer life is speeches to God, then clearly we don't understand what we are praying for. When you kneel to pray, it's because you are asking for power to do something. Why are you kneeling to pray when you are not ready to transform? Because when you are praying, you are asking God to give you power to achieve. What's the point of being given power when you are not ready to do the work? So all Africa is kneeling, oh Lord, hear us. To do what with the power that you will give? To do what? To still wake up? Think about this. We've got guys who are going to God every day. Oh, please, please hear my prayers. To do what? So that when God has given you power, you will then say, uh, you, 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 your, your dream is to, to, to marry a man who will take care of you. So why must God answer your prayers? Let him just answer the prayers of the guy who will take care of you. Because you clearly don't want to do anything. Imagine me, a God, listening to a girl praying, Lord, hear my prayers. And I'm thinking, but your dream is for a man to take care of you. So basically, I don't need to hear you. I must just hear that guy. Because he wants to do something with his life. When I answer him, he will answer you. Because your prayer is him, his prayer is me. You don't pray unless you are ready to use the power. If you are going to go to God on your knees as a young woman and say, God, hear my prayer, it better be because when you get up, you will build life for yourself. You cannot go to God as a young man and say, Lord, hear my prayer. And then when you get up from there, 
you go pay a bribe. Why did you pray? You already knew the solution. Something doesn't make sense about praying and then paying a bribe. You already knew how to open the door. Why were you praying? Take your money, bribe someone. You know what to do. People will pray on their journey to bribe a government official. Oh Lord, be with us on this journey. What do you mean? <laughs> you are going there to bribe someone. Therefore, prayer is unnecessary because there's no power required to help you. Prayer is for people who are saying, Lord, I refuse to do what is wrong in your sight. I'm going to meet the mayor of this city. Go with me. Because then when you get there, when the mayor wishes to request a bribe, then the kingdom of God will silence him and say, this is our child. You will give him the signature he needs without immorality. And he will find himself signing. And he will find himself asking, but how did I give them? Because you prayed, then prayer supplied power. But you can't pray and then pay a bribe. Beloved, all I am saying to you is simple. I'm impressed to see so many young people attending here today. But then we need to solve one problem. These numbers mean nothing if you are still thinking like slaves. You can't have so many young Adventists here and Zimbabwe is still suffering. It means the numbers are large but the brains are small. <laughs> Don't feel bad, it's happening everywhere in South Africa as well. Many numbers, you call for a camp meeting, hundreds of people, but you look at what is happening in our country, you can tell the brains are small. Because although we've got the numbers, we are lacking the liberation of the mind. That is why with black leaders in Wabulawayo, the city would fall apart. But if I brought you one mayor from England who's white, all of you would behave. You've already imported. You know what that guy needs? He doesn't need a thousand white people. He needs 15 whites from England to come and be his cabinet. All of you would start obeying the rules of the road. You would start driving where your car needs to be. You would park where you're supposed to park. Why? The brain. The African brain doesn't take an instruction unless it sees whiteness. <laughs> Many of the things I have said may have been phrased in humor. But hear me very well. The Bible teaches that you worship a God who transforms minds. And if we are not ready to transform the mind, none of our prayers are going to come true. We will keep praying until we die. But I'm saying, the Adventist Church in Zimbabwe and the Zimbabwe itself is not hopeless yet. You are still here. And if you give God your brain, God can still do something amazing in this country. But first, he needs a brain that doesn't worship Egypt. He needs a brain that is willing to cross the desert to make a difference. Hear me. Hear me, please. Please hear me. I am pushing an agenda of Africans who will not immigrate to London. Africans who will stay and solve their continent. I'm not apologetic about it. 
I refuse to believe God loves whites more than us. I refuse to believe they are smarter than us. They can't build those cities and we can't as if we don't have brains. It's all about the transformation of the mind. And I'm making an appeal to you. Let's not relocate to London. Let's fix our homeland. But not by praying endlessly. We've done the praying. And I can guarantee you God has heard us. Now we need to get up and do something. For our children. For their children. And their children's children until Jesus comes. You and I must do something. But we need to stop thinking like free people, not like slaves. So I'm praying now. I'm going to make an appeal for the slaves to remain seated. It may sound fun, but quite honestly, if you are not ready for God to use you to make a change, sit. But if we are burning inside with a desire of a better country, a better family, a better lifestyle, a better continent, a better church, a better way of revealing Christ to the world, then you need to stand with me and we pray. Because we need God to transform our minds. And we can't do this as long as we still think like slaves. Something has to change. And if you are in that position, stand as we pray. If you are at peace, you don't want problems, sit. God will take care of you. Don't worry, I promise you. No one is cursing you. God will take care of you. But if you know that you want God to do something in your lifetime, in your generation, that Bulawayo, Zimbabwe will never forget that Africa will look back at and say, these are the generation who changed our story. They accepted the invitation from God to walk away from thinking like slaves and start thinking like sons and daughters of God. Then that is what we want. It is my prayer. That you will not only change your life personally, but that before you hit the grave, you will have done your part in making this country a better country. No more excuses. No more waiting for people to come from outside and deliver us. Let God transform our minds and change our lives. Shall we pray together? Father, in the name of Jesus, we are young, we are intelligent, we are gifted. Some of us are in the middle of our lives, experienced, wise. There is just one thing we need. We need you to give us brain surgery. We think like losers. We think like slaves. We think like people who have not been purchased with the blood. Our thoughts suggest we are godless. We are afraid of thinking big and doing big. We have found peace in mediocrity and righteousness in failure. Help us, Jesus. Teach us to see solutions where everyone sees a problem. Teach us to see a way forward where everyone says nothing can be done. Teach us to be stubborn when it comes to trusting you. 
that when everyone tell, tells us it's impossible, as long as you whisper, march forward, teach us to obey. I pray for this city. I pray for the people who live in it. I pray that the youth of your Christian army may never go to the grave having not made their contribution into making Guabulawayo one of the greatest cities in the continent. I pray that Christianity here, all churches, Adventists, Methodists, Baptists, whatever, may we all, at least with one voice, speak to make this country a better place. Forgive us our sins. Where we have erred, may the blood of Jesus cover us. And may the Holy Spirit empower us for the decisions we need to take. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.